it started so yeah. just for a primer you guys what we're going to be talking about today is the, the general characteristics of uh, newtonian and uh, maxwell theories and we'll also explore a little bit towards the end as to what it signifies in uh, in quantum mechanics like is it there do the same characteristics apply uh, or is it changed in any sense has it changed in any sense uh, so let me begin with uh, uh, just a general overview of what uh, newtonian mechanics is well we have all seen these equations uh, we all know what they mean very basic very fundamental laws we've been studying them for years at this point they're pretty much cooked into our intuition first is the law of gravitation the second is the you know uh, the second is basically the they call it the fourth law for some reason of newton which is basically sum of all forces uh, acting on an object the second law the third law so there there's something really weird about uh, newtonian mechanics though and uh, let me try to sh shine some light upon that the issue is ob obviously when we consider such a situation for example we have two objects here and we have a third object here and they all exert forces on each other based upon these equations and they're very well governed and uh, we have a very clear idea of what they are and how they work right uh, but this is a small problem here these forces are they can affect moving bodies and we're aware of how and they're transmitted as well but for example if i make a small change here if i move body 1 by a small uh, you know uh, perturbation dx for instance what happens is instantaneously all the forces f21 f23 f12 f f13 they all instantly change that's kind of uh, absurd uh, well even newton himself wasn't exactly comfortable with this but this is what his theory was pointing towards instantaneously uh the force was changing and this is what you know in the direct sense these equations imply there is there is uh, to put in a very naive analogous sense there is really no damping term for the propagation of causes between uh, two two things or more than two things for instance in newton mechanics and uh obviously another feature of newtonian mechanics is what is called uh, simultaneity Uh, so this is a space and diagram right and uh, for example this is just a toy system that we've taken up uh, this is a binary uh, system uh, and we've also explored how that works and for example this is another uh, object close to the binary system or orbiting the binary system as a whole well if you take this slice in the space time diagram it just uh, appears to be you know simultaneous all of these events occurring at the same time well that would also imply that you know this is the right way this is the right frame to uh view the the particular system because this has a verdict and this verdict should hold simultaneity should should hold according to newton's equations but uh, obviously uh, we've gone past that sr breaks these rules in a sense uh, as we've seen in the previous weeks as to why it does that as well now i'll just hand it over to mukund to talk a bit about uh, maxwellian uh, dynamics um yeah so maxwell and uh, like we know like uh, electro and electrostatics and electrical forces um were discovered mostly by like michael faraday and people uh, like michael faraday and uh, other people but then what we're going to focus mainly on is what maxwell did in the field of electrodynamics so maxwell brought in the concept of real relativity to uh, electrical electrodynamics and electrostatics so we uh, we all know that um, electrostatics in electrostatics you have the fundamental equation that is electric field uh, the force due to an electric field is given by k times uh, q1 q2 by r square so <clears throat> the, this is uh, another and we know that the electric field is nothing but the uh, uh, electrical force divided by the charge given given point charge that is kq that is f is equals to e by q 
and uh, sorry e is equals to f by q so these are the fundamental equations that uh, you know like brings us to the world of electrodynamics and electrostatics so, but then like we, we know that uh, maxwell maxwell he uh, tried to you know like improvise the given set of equations into a form wherein you have a both electrical and magnetic field in a dynamic system so in this case we look at the first maxwell equation that is uh, you know the gradient of electric field is nothing but rho by epsilon naught so this rho is nothing but your charge density that is uh, you know like uh, electric field per unit volume so this is your charge density and then the gradient of the electric field vector also gives you the uh, rho by epsilon naught and then the second one is uh you know like uh, this is given uh, is given like the gradient of magnetic field is zero like the uh, like the dot product or the, like you can call it as um, the scalar product of the magnetic field is zero as because there is no net out outer magnetic field right so because like the magnetic fields they form sort of a loop wherein there is no beginning there is no ending and uh, they form sort of a loop so they kind of you know, cancel out each other at two different directions and the net magnetic field outside is basically zero so that's what this basically tells us and the third one is based based on ampere circuital law which says that the, uh, the like the curl of the magnetic field is nothing but mu naught j so j is where your current density current uh, density so current density is nothing but your uh, charge times velocity per unit volume so that is your current density here this is the third uh, maxwellian equation and he also added another term that is as you can see the second term on the right hand side that is epsilon mu naught uh, dou e by dou t so this dou e uh, the, the the second term on the right hand side is what is called as displacement current so the displacement current is nothing but the current which can pass through vacuum in like between two capacitors between the space of the two capacitors that's what we were taught when we were you know like in high school so this was all this also has to do something with you know like how the magnetic field can produce electric field and electric field can also produce magnetic field so this gave an idea to maxwell so that's the fourth equation is what he thought from the thir uh, third maxwellian equation so why not uh, like how faraday's law tells us that you know like the, cha the change in magnetic field produces electric field the similar way the change in electric field should produce a magnetic field like electric 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 field and magnetic field are nothing but the two sides of, of the same coin right so wherever there's an electric field there will be a magnetic field, and where there is a magnetic field there will be an electric field the change in the electric field produces magnetic field and vice versa so this these four equations are basically the four maxwellian equations and in the third equation in the third maxwellian equation where you can see the you know like the curl of b is given by mu naught uh, j vector plus epsilon or mu naught dou e by dou t this also like uh, you know shows us that the speed at which the uh, you know the electric electromagnetic wave tra travels through space or through vacuum like because this is uh, permeability, permeability and permittivity in free space that's in vacuum so we can finally uh, we can uh, relate these equations and we can get to know that the speed of the electromagnetic wave is exactly equal to the speed of light so uh, this is uh, given by the ref relation that is the speed of light c is equal to 1 by root of epsilon naught mu naught and uh, this 1 by uh, root of mu epsilon naught mu naught is basically what is uh, the velocity or the speed of an electromagnetic wave through vacuum so what what does this tell us like how uh, Puger has explained in his previous uh, topic that whenever there's a change that happens anywhere in in the, in the newton newtonian mechanic world it's it's in instantaneous right like whenever i change somewhere it's in it instantly ch try, changes another body which is being influenced by it but in this uh, maxwellian world of electrodynamics it's not the case the change happens at the speed of light and there is a, a delay at like the how uh, like the, there is a specific value it's not instantaneous it's not like just uh, this one snap of finger and then it changes it changes at the speed of light and it's not instantaneous that shows us the way uh, like the locality like the, uh, the concept of locality comes in here so the concept of locality again will be explained by Puger in the next talk and uh, Jim in the next uh, this, this next section and the final equation is nothing but your famous Lorentz force that says that the uh, force experienced by, by a particle in electromagnetic field is given by the sum of the four sum of the you know the forces of electric field and the magnetic field
So F is equals to sum of electric uh, sum of the force due to electric field that's QE, and then the sum due to magnetic field that is Q into V cross V. So these are the four Maxwellian equations along with the Lorentz force that gives us a basic idea about how uh, you know the, how the forces and how the particles interact with electric and magnetic field uh, in a given space. So I'll hand it over to Pugar to talk about the next to topic. Thank you, Mukund. Uh, well, so locality is uh, basically, in a sense, uh, sort of saying, you know, that these changes take a finite amount of time to progress. And the time taken, according to Maxwell's dynamics, is the, given by the constant C, which is basically the speed of light. And this is, this is a very fairly rudimentary way of arriving at it and this is how we first found out that this was this you know this c term represents the speed and then eventually someone measured it at the end of the day but it fundamentally came from just this very naive equation where we just plugged in the constants and uh, again this is the wave equation and this was also derived uh, from these the first four equations and by the simple use of uh, vector calculus uh, well, that's a lot uh, that you can do by just <laughs> math. But yeah, com coming back to locality, well, as I said, it means, for example, if this is a source of light, for instance, uh, then we've seen in special relativity that you have something that's called a light cone. And this is because uh, we commonly represent the speed of light C to have a... Uh, gradient 1 so that means it must be the diagonal line that is here this this diagonal it must have a un, uh, you know uh, the gradient 1 so that's why it, it it's the you you cannot have anything below this you cannot have any because that sort of violates special relativity right so well anything that's here right something that that's being caused here it could not have possibly been caused by something outside the light code. So this is the uh, naive view of uh, locality that's sort of propagated by just looking at the wave equation. And the reason we can see this is because the C is a constant and it's a finite thing and it uh, fairly rounds up to a very high degree of accuracy, uh, uh, 3 into 10 to the power 8 that we're aware of. And uh, this can be shown through a, a, f a few more equations, more uh, precisely. For instance, uh, here we've actually, uh, although Mukun did mention it, that uh, f is a point source. Uh, I've not explicitly stated in the equation that f must be a point source. So uh, the way we do that is we would just show what is called a delta distribution on top of this. So a delta distribution obtains uh, the peak of that particular uh, function it is multiplied by at a given point as its input so it's a functional right so if so the easiest way to just is just to shove a delta distribution on in next to this right and then it will become a point source and when you solve uh, for the point source actually well you'll you'll end up with a, uh, a slight early different uh, transformation so what happens uh, when i move uh, in the in this frame in this uh, space time frame well you'll get something along the lines of t you won't get something along the lines of t is equal to t dash but instead you'll get t is equal to t, t dash plus uh, x by c something all right and this uh, x by c something is exactly what uh, locality means right but there's a slight issue with this one uh, it isn't exactly on the most strongest mathematical footing because it's more of an abstract philosophical idea and it's it's very tied to maxwell's idea of the world and the maxwell or newtonian idea is deterministic which in the sense that if i know the initial conditions and if i know how a system evolves Boom! I, I know the future. Uh, it's, it's also known as Laplace's dream, which in the sense that if we knew all the initial conditions of all bodies in this world and we knew how they would evolve, one could just think about the past and future as if they were merely the same thing. Right? That's what uh, determinism 
in a very general sense means. Uh, but as we all know, there are non-deterministic theories. Uh, there are theories that are completely about randomly moving things such as uh, statistical mechanics and quantum mechanics. Uh, how would we sort of genera generalize the uh, notion of uh, locality for them? Well, uh, that's what uh, Bell did, and I'll cover that. But before that, uh, let me just, uh, you know, go through this notion again. So this point, whatever this causes in the future, that's in the future light cone, anything outside it, technically not possible according to special relativity, because the speed of light C is the maximum speed you can reach, uh, you know, wh whatever reference frame you're in. And also this... Uh, you can also look at what I, what it means for a past light cone, right? So you could actually take sections of a past light cone and say, okay, if I take this section, this could lead to different paths, and that is logically correct as well. And this is what will actually allow us to concretely pin down uh, what uh, locality means. And uh, we'll go into that, by the way. So this is just a magnified view of... Uh, the previous picture, the capital T basically means uh, some time T has passed between this gray slice and this point which I'll call chi because I've used the Greek letter chi here. Right? So, well, what is this image actually trying to tell us? Well, if I take a slice of my uh, space time, past space time cone, which I'll call sigma or C sigma, which is section sigma. Well, I can say that this chi of x comma t is basically a function of this section of the space-time uh, diagram. So this is just putting what I said earlier into more mathematical and more abstract terms, which is I can determine whatever happens here if I know this. Right? But this is good. This is obviously an improvement from the intuitive, uh, you know, generalized philosophical idea that we had. But it's still not concrete and there's a small uh, hole in it. Whoops, something seems to have happened here. Okay. Uh, well, yes. So, well, what I've sort of drawn here. Mm. Yes. So what I've drawn, wait, let me just check my other slides. Oh boy, there's a, I had forgotten, <laughs> okay, I had forgotten to place an equation there. Uh, apologies. Uh, yeah. Let, uh, okay, just uh, give me a moment. Let me fix this. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, Omega Vinci, you've deafened yourself. Can someone just ping him and tell him that him or her, they won't be able to hear anything.
Uh, I hope you guys can see my screen now. And uh, sorry for the ruckus. Uh, it, was a, it was a quite glaring mistake, so I thought I'd fix it right away. Yeah. So let's get to Bell's reformulation. So this is there, but as I was saying, uh, it requires a little bit more conditioning because there's a small problem with this. And the problem is that, uh, you know, if there are two light cones, past light cones in such a uh, such an essence, they need to be shielded off completely. And first of all, I'll, I'll just, uh, uh, well, the sufficient condition is this, in the sense that if I have a section sigma here, well, and that specifies, that determines an event chi 1 here, at, or event 1, for instance. But um, below the uh, section sigma, I have a, another uh, event that's propagated, that's called event 2, right? Uh, well, this would, would this sort of affect uh, sigma? W will there be an issue? And the, the truth is no, because we have to ensure two things. One is they are shielded off appropriately and that all the necessary information for one must be contained in this section, which includes this part as well. So this intersection as well is contained here. So that's what I've expressed here. The probability of an event one occurring provided a, uh, you know, section sigma given to me is just the same as uh, the probability of the event occurring, uh, uh, event one occurring given a section sigma and, a, uh, uh, you know, a pro uh, probability of an event two occurring. So you'll notice that the probability of this event occurring has not really changed uh, my first event. And that's because I, uh, I have said, or I have, it, it, it is a necessary condition that all of the information here is computed by this light cone. Otherwise, I mean, sorry, this section of the light cone. Otherwise, uh, this uh, will not uh, certainly hold. Uh, but also, you'll uh, an even more wilder thing happens if I just decide to move this light cone a little bit more towards the left. This is absolutely wild. <laughs> this is, uh, and well, what 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 happened here? Well, uh, so for example, let's take a non-deterministic theory such as quantum mechanics. An event A might happen even if it's not, you know, supposed to happen in the sense that we don't completely determine an event. We just say that there are probabilities, right, in quantum mechanics. So, so. Uh, well, so even if the sigma completely determines A, it may not happen according to quantum mechanics. Something other uh, may uh, happen, right? So, hmm, yes. So if, for instance, we do the same thing as last time, which is I specify along with this section sigma, I specify uh, another light cone to the future of sigma that has an event b but then so it also has an event x so you could say in some sense that event x was influenced by the light cone right because you can quite clearly see that this is certainly influencing this so the, obviously there's a subtle difference between influencing and causing but it is certainly influencing x right well, the weird thing is X does sort of cause B in a sense, right? Well, then in a local theory, you cannot have uh, this. You cannot have, well, you cannot have B, which is, which could be influenced and determined by the section sigma, which lies outside the light cone. You know, that's the point. It's sort of breaking locality here because it's it's an event outside the light cone, but it's being it's somehow being caused by something that's inside the light cone. It's it's absurd. It's totally bizarre from what we just discussed. But this well, wh what does this mean? Uh, let me just leave it open for a second. So, what do you guys think it means? Uh, Yuvraj and uh, Sundaresan, you guys, what do you guys think? 
you can put it up in the chat as well guys you guys can type it out in the chat hello i'm audible right or did i <laughs> was i was i talking for yeah yeah, yeah. No, no, no i can i can hear you mm. really ivraj sundaresh modi guys think <laughs> what's one plus well no so that means i can hear you yeah 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 but like what do you guys think about this so well i've just given you a very bizarre situation where even outside the light cone is caused by something that's inside the light cone mm okay that's an interesting uh, point <laughs> it's a well uh, again there there's some debate around that as well is the apr paradox really non local or not hello yes Wait, someone's joined in hello can you hear me whoops Can you guys see my screen? No. No. No, it came like the stream has ended. Okay, one second. Uh, stream has ended. Okay, how about now? Can you? Uh, ah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Okay, one second. Let me just pop this out so that. Whoops. Ah, uh, go ahead. Uh mm huh. -hmm. One second. just going to change uh you know because this was like i switched devices there was a small issue in recording it yeah but i'm back uh so what do you guys think uh this well i want to hear from sundaresh specifically what do you think sundaresh uh sundaresh and i either that's when i'm having a network problem that's yeah. right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you can text in the channel as well are you waiting for like more replies or i'll i'm just going to give it a minute aha uh -huh. hello pugar mm -hmm. yep like where where is this chat box you are saying like i'm um, i don't know it's right next to this voice channel like i i think when since you're on mobile you just need to Uh, don't exit it. Just go no, go back no, to the server. I'm not able to find it. It's called like, Cafe One Text. Uh, like, like just tell me what. Uh huh. What? Sorry. Just tell you what. Yeah. So what was your question actually? Like I'm not I'm not able to hear you properly. Like I'm having another problem here. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Tell me like what was your question? Yeah. So what do you think of this? Like the event happening outside the light cone, like that is what you are asking, right? Mm -hmm. Hello. Yeah. Hello. That's what I was saying. Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, then I'll I'll tell you what. So this is uh, so obviously we're talking about locality here, and if you really want the local notion of locality to survive, then you must say that it's preserved in a sense, or because we really want to just define locality here. We don't want to define non-local here. This is obviously non non-local in a sense, right? So. uh well this is why i was saying earlier that apart from if you want to determine an event at one you must not only say that this 
segment uh, sigma contains all the inferences that can be drawn previously like below it but it must also be shielded from another light cone uh, i'm sorry there's some noise coming in uh, please mute yourselves over it is thank you so well if you have the situation you are uh, you are breaking okay in a sense you are breaking a belief because this is just a postulate that we're holding but it's also held uh, physically true for maxwell and uh, physically true for uh, special relativity in a sense and gr uh, you know as a result of that so in a even in a non deterministic theory you know even not just for a deterministic one so we've proven we've sort of extrapolated from maxwell to a very generic sense whether if i have a you know probability of event occurring at one is determined is the very same if i specify two different events or three different events outside it along with the specification sigma because the two or three different events should not lie because it absolutely just violates what we were considering as locality so it should not this line should not touch or cross or be you know influenced by any part of the second sigma so this is what is referred to as bell's reformulation as of locality and i'll just leave you guys with a small uh, toy uh, example that we can take so we have a particle mass m that is these are basically uh, you know it's 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 space time and uh, this is the path taken there this is called the world world line right so yeah uh, so you have part part pass of uh, i'm sorry <laughs> particle of mass m <laughs> in the very center and then you have two particles a uh, mass is small m to the left and right right so uh, let's say this is the world line through which uh, the mass m passes through the world line of mass m passes through a point 1 right and uh, and it will only pass through one if everything remains as described right so the complete specification is again given by this slice sigma and it's if it's at rest then there's no issue there it's just the same world line and sigma determines everything but let's suppose the mass m on the left for instance just is there it's permanently there no issues but the mass uh, on the right side the small mass m because uh, small m it can be left in the place we'll call that well it can yeah it can be left in the place or be pushed to the left a little so we'll call this being here chi 2 and then we'll call this big pushed perturbed a little or changed a little chi 2 dash so well again we have the same equations that sort of apply here so suppose so uh, in a sense that we can say that the probability of this event one occurring provided we have a specification chi 2 is just one because if if it's just chi 2 means all of these just same say in the same place so this world line obviously will pass through one there's no uh, you know there's no there's going to be no change but if in the particle on the right you know is pushed to the left the two gravitational forces on m will no longer add up to zero because they are not equally separated am i right in saying i'm right in saying that so they don't exactly cancel out so the probability will become zero immediately it will become zero in the, in the sense that the probability of event one occurring because the the world line will obviously move towards m a little because of the gravitational attraction uh, increases as the distance be between them is decreased right and this is also absurd because these are obviously outside the world lines and is obviously outside the section sigma but these are influenced by them in a sense so this is just the toy model of this equation and uh, this is the defining equation uh, for uh, locality and i'm going to let mukund talk about ontology a bit after this yep so yeah so ontology is basically 
uh, a fancy word in philosophy for what really exists and what doesn't so in general for like what we've seen until now for what really exists for uh, instance we can consider newtonian mechanics wherein we see the particles and how they interact with various forces like for example gravitational force and for in electrodynamics we see how the particles and fields interact with each other so we can often like uh, mathematically formulate like the equivalent ways to formulate the basic laws of a theory and this and we can also like think about what the formulation actually means and we can find we can try to think about what really exists in the equation and what doesn't so in electrodynamics we've come to uh, we've uh, come we, we could have come across some terms called as like the scalar potential and the vector potential right so let us uh, like using those we'll try to uh, discuss like we'll try to understand what basically the formulation of what really exists and what doesn't and what should be taken care in one equation actually means so for example looking at the first equation so b is our magnetic field right so let's define our magnetic field in an, in a in a space uh, as like the curl of another vector another vector that's a so using the using the given condition that we've discussed in the first equation let's put it in faraday's equation so our faraday's equation is nothing but your uh, curl of b is nothing but uh, minus uh, you know like dou dou e by dou t right like how the change in magnetic field gives rise to an electric field so then we we try to bring like what happens here is exactly uh Booker, if you go if you could um, okay that equation is not here um, okay so basically the faraday's equation says that curl of b is equals to minus dou e by dou t right so well let's take the uh let's define a uh, uh, substitute for b curl of a so we have curl of a and then curl of e and then dou b by dou t so then we'll rearrange the terms and we took the curl as common factor out and then we have the second equation here so this condition and the basically the right hand side is actually zero i think we have forgotten to you know add that part so the right hand side of the equation number 16 is zero since we took the all the terms to the left hand side and uh, so what we can actually say is that the equation that we see in the like this equation number 16 that we see here basically is equal to a vector like the scalar uh, potential that is 5 that's given they're presented by 5 so the minus uh, uh, so the minus gradient of the uh, scalar is nothing but your constant like how if you take a derivative and then like you try to integrate it you get a constant on the right hand side right so similar to that case in like the vector calculus in terms of gradients and uh, you know curl and uh, derivatives so in this you get a constant uh, start, start of a constant to the right hand side that's called as your uh, you know your scalar potential so the negative sign what we see here is basically like for our can we like a uh, form of notation like how in special relativity we saw that we take you know like the time factor negative in the matrix and then we leave the other factors so it's sort of a convention to take it as a negative sign there and using the equation 17 we can try to use this in, in our maxwell dynamic maxwell's uh, equations so Pugar, if you could just like go back to the maxwell's equations and give them uh, you know like a view of what they were like uh, yeah so we'll actually try to plug these equations in equation number five equation number six and equation number seven the given uh electric uh, the, the given equation for electric okay go back to that the, that's like ontologies so we have the uh, what we have here is we will find a general term for the electric field so the electric field will not be nothing but your like you'll take the second term in the left hand side and go uh, move it to the right so your electric field will be nothing but your minus gradient uh, your negative uh, gradient of your scalar potential minus dou a by dou t so let's try to substitute it in the first uh, you know equation of max uh, maxwell's uh, electrodynamics so the first equation was nothing but your so you know like your scalar product of your electric field would be equal to rho by uh, epsilon naught uh, that is basically your gauss law for electrostatics right so when we substitute it uh, we get an equation number we get an equation like equation number 18 right so you get your like the, the dot product of your uh, gradient times 5 so it'll be like it'll be dot like the plus square like the tepla is the you know like the uh, 
uh, the function that is being put there. So depla square phi will be because because it's depla times depla because dep, uh, depla times electric field will be equal to rho by sigma, and then plus you have to uh, do uh, use the function for the second term, wherein you can take the differential part outside and you can implement the uh, you know the gradient to the a vector. So this is when we substitute it in the, the equation number 18 is a result of substituting the given condition of finding the electric field into Maxwell's first law of electrodynamics. Now let's try substituting the same thing in the second second equation of, uh, I mean third, basically third equation that is, you know, inspired from the uh, um, Ampere's law of, uh, so Ampere, Ampere's law. So this is the third uh, equation of Maxwell's electrodynamics. And then we try to uh, as exactly substitute for electric and magnetic fields in the same case. So we get an equation number 19. But looking at the equation number 19, we've actually not, um, you know, like we've, we have like way too many terms to deal with. And this equation doesn't look, you know, it doesn't mean much as such as to what we are going to find from uh, doing the basic uh, substitution that is B is equals to, you know, the curl of A. So what we try to do is, Probably you guys have uh, like heard of this they call as the Gaussian transformation. So since the uh, so why uh, why did we, uh, how uh, was the fact that we took B vector like the uh, like magnetic field as a curl of another vector? So do you remember the first equation? The second Maxwell's equation says that the uh, you know like the gradient of the magnetic field is zero. So if I take the gradient of the equation number fifteen, so basically I'll, I'll get the same value, right? Gradient of a scale of a vector product is nothing but a zero, right? So my equation number one in the uh, equation number fifteen in this holds true. So that's why I took I was able to take. Like magnetic field is nothing but the curl of another vector, which basically holds true for magnet uh, for uh, Maxwell's second law of electrodynamics. So in the same case, I can even uh, consider this. Uh, so this was the basis for understanding what we need to actually add and what we need to actually make it uh, make make changes to the given set of abstract factors that is a and uh, phi, so that I can actually come up to a more sensible equation. So same way I can. Uh, you know, like I define my a vector as some a plus some depla of lambda. So this will also be this will also hold true uh, such that because like a curl of another again the same thing. So if I have I have your curl of a right. So if I have curl of a if I have curl added to the whole uh, equation on the left hand side I have curl of a and the right hand side I have curl of a and the plus curl of an again gradient gradient of depla so a gradient of lambda that is basically zero so i'll have curl of a is equal to curl of a left hand side answer we're all good here so this is a um, you know like a current as a correct assumption to be taken such that my condition still exists by making little changes right so this is basically what uh, gauss law of gauss's transformation actually is so Pugar, can you go to the next slide so basically, we'll try to do the same thing with your uh, other abstract factor that is your scalar potential. So scalar potential also can be defined as the scalar potential times, I mean the minus uh, the partial derivative of lambda with respect to t. So if I even plug it again in the same equation, minus uh, derivative, minus scalar product of lambda, I mean for uh, phi, I'll, I'll get the same equation again. So these kind of formula, the formulation or the terms that I add in order to make the same equation cc also it holds true when this uh, when the uh, also holds true when it's applied to the original set of equations so these two uh, are called as the gauss's uh, transformations so uh, when i apply these transformations we can go back to the previous slide yeah when i apply these transformations to so equation number 19 next day next day I'll, I'll get this equation uh, go back no next next yeah. So when I go, uh, when I apply these equations to equation number nineteen, I will. Uh, so I can. I'll get the following results. Okay. So the first result is when I up. Uh, when I apply this result, so what actually the causes transformation allows us to do is that. Uh, okay. So that's okay. So what actually uh, tells uh, the transformation or the kind of transformation that I've done using Gauss's transformation allows me to play along with the kind of abstract, uh, you know, notations or the abstract variables that I've used here. I can take a abstract variable, uh, abstract variable which is there in the equation, 
and then I can equate it to zero. So that my condition holds true because they're abstract and they don't have anything to do. The changes don't have anything to do with the change in the equation. So I can I can uh, change the equation to my wish by uh, such that it doesn't change the overall equation. So if I take my uh, the forget actually we we're missing like two equations in the middle. This thing. Yeah. So yeah, one equation. Yeah, we're missing a couple of equations in the middle. <laughs> no, 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 no. We can see this. So, uh, one second. That is in. If you are opening it in your PDF viewer, it is. Yeah. Okay. So I need to go a little up. Yeah, scroll up. Like up, up, up. Up. Yeah, uh, yeah this one's. No, no, no. Yeah, the 1.34. Yeah, that's what I need. So applying the given con like uh, we see in the 1.35 right where we try to add another factor that's your gradient of your la another another component that's lambda. So this is an example of a Gaussian transformation right. So the Gaussian transformation works that if I apply uh, the given set of uh, you know the functions or if, or if I substitute back it in the equation it doesn't make any change. So in the if you see in 1.34 so if I have um, Say in the right hand side, right hand side, uh, uh, we have the second term, right? Like your your depla times depla of a plus one by c squared d phi by dt. So if I apply the same function, if I if I substitute for a in the same case, again we'll have what? Like we'll have zero, right? I mean we'll have only like the same factors, and there's no overall change in the equation. So Apugar, can you go down next page? So I can. So yeah. So if you can read here, it is. Um, we can base the first choice choose the potential satisfying the Lorentz gauge condition. So Lorentz gauge condition is such that you can select a term out of the equation to be zero as they are like abstract terms, not the uh, basic terms as such. Should, we can choose the abstract terms and we can equate them to zero. And because it doesn't necessarily make any change to the original equation, so these kind of given conditions allow us to play a little with the abstract numbers. And we, if we consider like the equation 1.37. If you consider the gradient of a plus one by c squared dou phi by dou t to be equal uh, to be equal to zero, we'll have equation and uh, uh, scroll up. Okay. So if we uh, more, more no, previous page one point three, yeah, yeah. So if we apply the condition to equation one point three four, what we'll get here is that we'll we'll have the uh, right hand side to be only like what uh, the plus square a minus one by c square dou square a by dou t square will be equal to minus mu naught j vector. So this is my one condition, and the second condition is when uh, can you scroll down, program? Yeah, the se second condition what I can assume is that. Yes. Yeah, so those are actually my uh, you know like the abstract vectors. Like my phi is my scalar potential, and then. My A is like another way to represent my magnetic field. So my magnetic field is defined as a curl of another vector. That's A. Four vector of EM. No, actually we didn't do that in this case. It's like we're just trying to, you know, like tell what is uh, ontology, basically, like what is real, like what is actually real in an equation, and what is not. And uh, okay. So when we plug in the given conditions, that is in uh, equation 1.37 and 1.38, we get an equation that is 1.39, right? So that's uh, the plus square a minus 1 by c square dou square a by dou t square is equals to minus mu naught j vector. That's when my uh, above condition is equal to zero holds true in the Lorentz gauge transformation. So there is another tra uh, gauge, uh, gauge transformation called as Coulomb gauge transformation, which states that my 
you know basically the whole whole situation of our first equation wherein we said b is equal to curl of a and then the gradient of a should be equal to zero since it's defined in the in such sense right so we can using these transformations basically what we did is we made the equation much more easier rather like how uh, you know like for from 16 equations we can come back, come down to basically four or two equations basically in special relativity like using these transformations we can you know like crunch the equation to much more simpler and more reasonable uh, form so the final equation after applying the transformation is that we get in 1.4 equation 1.41 so what can we actually say 1.4 and 1.42 so what can we actually say so but then like if you consider equation 1.42 so we can say that the scalar potential will is it responds or it changes what happened? no there was another thing uh, I, okay so okay oh ludwig lawrence okay 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 can you scroll down okay so basically uh in uh when we try how another assumption what we make to make the uh, equation 1.41 possible is that we we take the speed of light to be infinity you see if even if i take it to be infinity that's the beauty of these transformations so transformations are done in such a way that i can get reasonable uh e okay. there are that's i can get up to a, get, get to a reasonable solution even while applying some conditions that that actually don't affect my original equation so uh, so if we if if we uh set that uh, speed of time is infinity so 1 by c square is what 1 by infinity is what zero so then my right hand side second term completely vanishes and i can get a reasonable solution for my equation but what is one of the cons of having uh, my speed of light to be infinity so i'm basically saying that my my change or when something some a force on electric and there's a change in the electric field or a magnetic field the change that is being experienced by the whole field is you know spontaneous like instantaneous so this basically uh, defies the uh, you know like maxwellian electrodynamics saying that it it's it's uh, locality part so it what we can uh, conclude by saying that is that uh, the vector uh, field and then the a vector are um, you know like instantaneous and they are non local uh, vectors okay can you scroll down further so to conclusion as to why we had to do all of this so yeah not that much yeah like i'm almost done yeah so why we had to do this transformation and what basically are we gaining from doing this thing like the uh, uh, like uh, this thing abstract spaces is that when i actually change my value of a and phi it doesn't actually mean i'm changing the value of my electric and magnetic field like if you see in the uh, in the last sentence of the paragraph the change in Elect, uh, the change in electric field and magnetic field and do not represent the the set of values for a and phi in the given uh, you know like the light cone uh, diagram like how you had chi right in bell's formula formulation of locality it's really that it exists but it's not uh, how it, the changes in electric and magnetic field don't uh, actually affect the value of a and chi so we can jot down to the uh, equation to uh, more simpler terms in the given set of, uh, below two equations that is 1 by c square dou square a by dou t square minus d plus square e is equal to 0 and 1 by c square uh, dou square b by dou t square minus d plus square b is equal to 0 so these uh, equations are called as like uh, laplace coulomb uh, gauge equations and uh, they can tell us that how fields interact irrespective of the particles like this is what is one of the main things in quantum mechanics right so we can't like you know like get a position or momentum like how the uncertainty principle exists so we have to work with the fields that is there within the particles i mean within the uh, within the system so this kind of uh, using the ontology part we can get to know how the electric and magnetic fields change within themselves so i think i'll head it uh, i'll continue it over to rishi right now to talk for the next stop
Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, probably got like bad reception right now. Yeah. Um, oops. Uh, okay, it's back. Hey, hello. Now, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, now it's back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so where are you right now on the stream? Okay, so just stop me if I sound robotic, right? Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I'll be talking about uh, the importance of measurement in the world of physics. So let us start by discussing the question, why is observation and measurement important when observing any phenomena? So we as physicists, we formulate theories and then or a hypothesis or putting in it a better word so we formulate hypotheses and then we try to prove it by obtaining concrete evidence such as observations or calculations so usually we use measurement to uh, substantiate our calculations or whatever theories that we have proposed so far so observation in the macroscopic sense is pretty straightforward right so let us take this simple example of calculating the acceleration and the position of a ball let's say so let's say we throw a ball into the air right above our head with an initial velocity and an acceleration so we can use uh, newtonian mechanics to quite simply uh, figure out the exact position and the highest height that the particle might obtain. So the fundamental equation here is f is equal to ma. So using very simple calculation, we can calculate that given the initial conditions on the force, we can calculate the initial velocity, the height that the object reaches and so on. So now that we have calculated the uh, whatever we want to find out, so how do we substantiate that? So in this case, it's pretty simple. You just measure how high the ball went using, let's say, tools. So the tools that you decide to use might greatly vary. Yes. So we might just end up using a naked eye so we can just you know eyeball it and be like okay so it went like two feet into the air if you're weak or oh look it went like six feet in the air if you're a buff guy so that is a primitive way of you know measuring how the maximum height of that ball and then if we want to sophisticate how we measure such and uh, such a phenomena we can use let's say a ruler let's say, and we measure crudely we we decide like okay fine say hi when you chuck the ball up into the air and i will measure the time it takes for the ball to reach the highest point in the ruler and i take these two measurements and it's pretty simple that we can you know we can verify our calculations 
So to make this more accurate, let's say we can use light gates for instance. So we measure the time taken for the ball to pass two points in that uh, given space by placing two laser light gates that you know shuts down when the ball passes through it. So now this is pretty simple, right? There is nothing complicated in Newtonian mechanics, let's say, because it is mostly just macroscopic particles or macroscopic objects that we have to, you know, look into here. So let us move into a more, let's say, not complicated as such, but a little bit more sophisticated system here. So next we move on to Maxwellian electrodynamics. So what is it here that we are trying to measure in Maxwellian electrodynamics? That is simple. We are trying to either quantify or measure the strength of an electric field or the strength of the magnetic field and its effect on any particle that is in that electric field or magnetic field. So we know as again, same thing as in Newtonian mechanics, we can easily calculate what happens to a charged particle in that space by using the simple equation F is equal to QE. So where F is the force, electric force on the charged particle and you rearrange that and you can calculate the strength of the electric field. So if you see here, like I don't think he put the equation in here, but it's a simple equation E vector is equal to M by Q multiplied by the acceleration. So which is pretty straightforward, you see, because you just put F is equal to MA and then you take the Q to the other side and then you'll end up with that equation. So as again, you know, mathematics might be difficult here, but then it's pretty simple to calculate the overall force that the electric field ex exerts on that particle. So then now that we have, let's say, calculated theoretically what force that um, is exerted on the charge particle, we need to look into, so this electric field or the magnetic field as such isn't observable to the naked eye as such. You can't just see electric fields passing through the sky or you can't just see the magnetic field like between two magnets. It's, let's say we use the word invisible or microscopic in this sense. We cannot easily measure or directly measure the phenomena, but what, what we do instead is we measure, measure the observables or the speed at which the particle itself travels, right? So it's pretty simple here. So we can, we can use Google, I have you moved on to the next slide. So there, there, there were two equations, right? Google, the one for yeah, 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 the one for acceleration, I guess. Ah, yes, thank you. So you moved on to the next one. Okay. So we can, we cannot visualize the electric field as such, but then what we can visualize or detect is the speed of your charged particle. Now that might be still small, but you can still physically measure how fast or the uh, magnitude of the charged particle. So it's pretty simple here using these two equations as uh, is on the monitor right here. You can calculate the acceleration, which is pretty simple. You just measure two uh, points at which the particle is traveling in that electric field and uh, you just uh, calculate the delta and then it's a pretty simple calculation. So you substitute that into your 31st e into equation 31 and right there you don't have you know the electric force or which is which could be you know not seen by the naked eye but then you transformed it into something that you can measure and verify in this concept so then yes so we can move on to the next slide now so the next slide, so this is just a very uh, abstract picture of what a measuring device could be. This could be whatever, this could be an ammeter, this could be a geyser counter, or it's just, let's say, an apparatus that you use to measure something. 
so if you notice there there is a small scale in which you know you can quantify or you can measure exactly the intensity or uh, let's say in this uh, example here the velocity or it's just a concept let's say let's not just take the uh, picture in the uh, literal way so that needle there you could call it something called as a pointer so what is a pointer you see a pointer is something that can be used to directly observe uh, let's say a direct phenomena or something that cannot be you know visualized by the naked eye so how do we verify theories or hypotheses or whatever uh, you know you've been working out at your home at your own freedom so all that we are trying to do here is see we all know what measurement is so measurement we've been doing it since second grade physics lab right so it's not a complicated concept but what we are trying to you know visualize or conceptualize here is the pointers right how we use pointers or the pointer could be anything right it could be as i said it could be visible or you know something more abstract right so how do we use pointers in this in this uh, uh, literal sense to vary to verify our theories right so that is something that we need to look forward to in quantum mechanics and such so i would like to just pose an open question here you can so what do you think are observable or what do you think are the pointers in this case for a quantum mechanical system right so i'd like to move on to the next topic which is again something that we've all heard of abstract spaces so pugal can you move on to the next slide so yes so let us forget the diagram here right so what are abstract spaces and such so in newtonian and maxwellian dynamics as we've seen in the past so we have conventional system let's say as uh, there are you can quantify or we can visualize how the interactions occur in ordinary three dimensions which is x y and z or we could add another dimension or which is the fourth dimension of time or space time as uh, chinmaya pointed out in the text you there are four vector formulations of Uh, maxwell in electrodynamics as we didn't you know explore in here but i'm sure that he could uh, help us uh, you know extend into that topic maybe in a later talk but then what we are looking here or what we are focusing here is to you know to solidify solidify and consolidate our uh, knowledge of what an abstract space is so you, in physics to a point after a point let's say we can't just physically i know this sounds ironic but then you cannot physically visualize things anymore or even if you do things do not exactly go the way you want them to you want to observe them so what we do here is we move on to abstract spaces to simplify things in certain places to somewhat try to visualize the things that we cannot directly visualize in real life so in basic sense an abstract space is not a geometric space right but it's a function space so it and as i stated before it's a use, useful way to gain intuition into a behavior of a system so in the first slide here now let us look into the diagrams at hand here so we have two similar looking diagrams so this is called a phase space as we have mentioned before so what is a phase space you may ask so a phase space is just three dimensions x y z plus a momentum uh, vector or a momentum aspect to it so then which is also corresponding to the uh three dimensions so a px py and pz so let us not move into like three dimensions or let's say six dimensional phase spaces right now let's just consider 
this very simple example in front of us so if you take the uh, uh, diagram on the left it's a very simple and we just a particle moving in a straight line with a constant momentum so as you see the x progresses right as x increases the momentum stays constant right so then the momentum is constant so the particle is just traveling in a straight line in an open space right without any friction or whatever so we can also represent this in let's say uh, a distance speed time graph or let's say something like that to be a little bit more primitive but we will see more useful cases for phase spaces as we go on i will explain why we use phase spaces and why we you know try to complicate things to in order to simplify them <clears throat> so the second uh, diagram here it's a very interesting aspect so it is just a harmonically oscillating a, a one dim one dimensional harmonic oscillator so we can see here that as the maximum momentum is attained when the particle is at x equal 0 or let's say imagining a pendulum or a spring loaded object let's say so pogal can we move on to the next slide so what we see here is another uh, let's say an example of an abstract space so this is called the configuration space okay which is sounds pretty you know tricky but then it's very simple so if you see on the screen there there are th on the left is a simple one dimensional uh, axis so it has two particles in it one to the left of x equal 0 and one to the right of x equal 0 so what a configuration space does is tries to impose or you know to transform the first uh coordinate system into something more a bit more elegant so on the right here if you see it's essentially the same as the left but then here we just use a single point to map both of the particles in two dimensions each axis being x1 and x2 so if if we introspect a bit closer here for uh, a configuration space for a single particle is just a normal uh, let's say a normal two dimensional or three dimensional axis coordinate system so can we move on to the next slide i think we need to rush a bit here we are we have over shorter time we are 5:20 in okay so i'm just going to quickly just rush through this so this is a collision example uh, on screen here so the particle on the left let's call it p1 collides with the particle the second particle and you could see the gray arrows at the bottom that uh, indicates the before and after uh, collisions so it's it's a pretty simple example and the abstract space or the configuration space on the right shows the uh, collision in a more let's say elegant way so the dashed line there shows the exact uh, let's say position at which the pa the particle collided at right so let's move on to the next slide so i think is that all okay wait one second so yes so now we can move on to the next question which is pretty simple it must have come into all of your mind so and i did uh, pointed out at the beginning of this uh talk why abstract spaces see isn't it just easy to just you know use your normal three axis coordinate system or you know or physical coordinate systems or like a polar coordinate system or something like that the answer here is to simplify things so an example of where these the abstract space makes plays a major role in physics is in the hamiltonian form formulation of newtonian mechanics so we all know what the hamiltonian me mechanics or the hamiltonian formulation is so the hamiltonian operator is nothing but the kinetic energy of a system plus the potential energy of a system 
and uh, to put it in neater words it just you know reformulates the notion of f net equals ma into just the energy of the system right so where does phase space come into all of this so the newton sorry the hamiltonian mechanics is just the uh, there's just an equations of first order a differential equation of the system written in the with the positions of the particles in phase space right so we can see and as we saw some examples previously or we could maybe explore further examples of why hamiltonians and and the entire hamiltonian mechanics simplifies a lot of you know complicated problems in uh, newtonian or classical mechanics as such so then another uh, elegant example is the hamilton jacobi formulation of mechanics which is which involves a time dependent field on configuration space right so we are the book that we were all uh, that this talk was based on that doesn't really uh, elaborates on the use of uh, the hamilton and jacobi formulation so we are just going to skip on that so yes so that pretty much ends my topic but i would just like to pose a simple question like you could leave your comments so when we whether we try not to or whether we try to visualize things in abstract spaces so if we take the uh, example on the screen here so we so see a dotted line there right that the particle seemingly bounces off of so we already put a notion that abstract spaces aren't something that could be you know physically visualized but then a question might arise you know what is that dotted line is it some invisible barrier that the particle is bouncing off of or what is that dotted line exactly or what provides the force let's say that repels the our particle off of that dotted line we might ask so that that is a question i'll leave open to you guys you could put it in the comment section yeah so pugar yeah